Okay, maybe I can uh, uh, start with the introduction. So, good afternoon, almost evening from the Philippines. So we are in the eastern side of the <laughs> of the world. So almost evening here. So it is my uh, well, I am Edita Jose from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, and I am one of the organizers of this uh, webinar. So it uh, the first. Uh, uh, conference, a workshop conference was held here in the country last uh, 2017. And then we were at ICTS last 2019. So this is the third, as mentioned uh, earlier. So it is my pleasure to introduce our next lecturer, Dr. Daniel Peter Same. is the chair for computational mathematics at the University of Augsburg, Germany. He was previously a full professor for numerical simulation at the University of Bonn. His research covers all aspects of computational partial differential equations with applications in engineering and physics. Professor Peter Same is most well known for his contributions in computational multi-scale methods. Let us welcome Dr. Peter Same. Thank you very much, Edita, for the kind introduction and many thanks uh, to all the organizers for setting up this uh, very nice uh, workshop or school, let me say, and also thanks to ICTS for, uh, for hosting uh, this workshop. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot be in Bangalore. Actually, my, my last business trip or my last conference uh, trip uh, one year ago was to Bangalore just before the pandemic started. So I, I have seen the place, it's wonderful. Uh, so if you ever get the chance to go there, please, please do it. Okay, now uh, let me start with my lectures. Uh, here we go. Okay. So uh, my lectures are entitled Numerical Homogenization by Localized Orthogonal Decomposition. Um, so uh, among, uh, among the speakers, I, I'm the computational person, obviously, and uh, uh, the aim of my series of lectures is to share with you the more computational perspective onto homogenization problems. And I think from a conceptual Kind of point of view, it will be quite different what we will be doing uh, during the lecture. Uh, but of course, as we are solving the same type of problems at the end, it will turn out that the approaches are not so different in the end. But uh, let's see uh, uh, how far we can go with this. So I, I'm planning to, to have like three lectures of a very different natures. The first one today will be more an introduction, an overview that should try to uh, transport the idea of one particular numerical homogenization method, which is called localized orthogonal decomposition. Uh, so I will be using uh, this uh, presentation mode uh, today. Then uh, tomorrow I will dig a bit deeper into the theoretical uh, justification of the approach, and I will present you some details of the proof. And uh, on uh, the third day, uh, the lecture will actually uh, go into implementation aspects, and I will present some numerical experiments. So the, the material I'm going to present is actually contained in a book that we recently uh, published together with Axel Markvist, it's a small booklet actually, and uh, I will be using a few chapters of it. Um, but don't worry, you don't need to buy the book. I have prepared the essential material for you. Uh, and it's available under the link here that I will share later on also in the chat. So there you can also find copies of these slides and uh, more extended lecture notes. Uh, and of course, also the implementation, uh, uh, the code e examples. Okay, so for today, uh, for the general introduction, uh, let me start with a very brief motivation of the problem. Although, of course, uh, we have seen in the previous talks already uh, aspects of homogenization theory. Okay, so the, the background, uh, of course, is the following. Uh, 
uh, what we want to solve often in computational PDEs are problems with multiple scales, for example, material degradation problems, uh, porous media flow problems, wave uh, scattering problems, or problems related to uh, condensed matter. And all these kind of problems, of what always kind of turns out is that uh, mechanisms on a microscopic scale affect uh, macroscopic responses of the materials or the flows. And uh, what, uh, of course, numerical simulation has a very high potential for understanding these mechanisms, for making them visible, for doing simulations, for providing uh, guidance uh, to experimentalists, and also for material design. Uh, but the problem is uh, originating often from this multi-scale multi nature of the problem, and uh, the problem that one is not able, even with the largest computers, to resolve all aspects of a problem. So in my opinion, uh, both uh, modeling, what we have seen in the previous talks, and also numerical simulation has very high potential. Uh, the problem is, uh, from an, in, in the numerical uh, branch, that standard methods that you probably know, like the finite element method, uh, standard monoscale method tend to fail uh, unless you have resolved everything, all the important features of your problem. And uh, the most striking example for this is this very, very simple one-dimensional diffusion problem that the experts, of course, have seen many, many times. But uh, I think for students, it's, uh, it's very important to see the effect of a microscopic coefficient in the simplest possible situation, namely that of a diffusion problem in 1D. So you have seen our, D, our PDE before, divergence, A gradient of U equals some right-hand side, which in my example is just one. I put myself on the unit interval here, and I use the homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition. And the only troublemaker here is a coefficient A that I allow to oscillate on a small scale epsilon. The epsilon here is about one over a thousand. So here you see a zoom into the coefficient and uh, the corresponding solution uh, is now visible in red. As you can see on a macroscopic scale, so for you on your screen, it looks like a very nice parabola. But if you zoom in, you will see the effect of uh, the underlying oscillatory coefficient, namely on top of the <coughs> macroscopic part, there is a fine scale oscillation originating from the oscillatory coefficient. And uh, the frequency of this oscillation is one over epsilon and the amplitude is also epsilon. That's why you cannot see it on the macroscopic scale. Okay, now you say, well, I don't care too much about this oscillation. Uh, let me try to get this nice uh, parabolic uh, solution profile here. I have, uh, the finite element method at hand, I can simply compute everything and uh, this is what happens. So in principle, if you would like to, if you want to approximate the red function by a finite element function, say a piecewise linear continuous function that satisfies the Dirichlet boundary condition, then of course this is possible. Yeah? You can see here the dashed blue line is able to capture the macroscopic profile pretty well. I mean, this is only three degrees of freedom here. If you refine the mesh, then you will see that there is uh, some sort of convergence here. And on the right-hand side, I have also prepared for you the, uh, the errors. Uh, this is an L2 norm with respect to degrees of freedom. And you see that the dashed line uh, converges very fast. So in principle, one is able to capture the red curve, of course, with piecewise linears. Now, the problem is that in order to compute the dashed approximation here, one would need to know the solution of the problem, which for the particular case of our 1D diffusion problem is possible, but uh, in general, usually the solution is not available. That's why we need some sort of uh, approximations of it. And the typical approach would be to use a Galerkin projection or a Galerkin method. This means that one computes in the space of piecewise linears the best approximation of the unknown solution. 
And best here it refers to a norm that is induced by uh, the variational form of the problem that we will see in a second. Okay, and even though the Galerkin method has this kind of best approximation property, you see what happens. Uh, let me go back. Uh, rather than computing the dashed blue line, which would be the one that uh, even my children would draw if I asked them to approximate the red curve well, the Galerkin method produces something that is off on a macroscopic scale. Okay. The parabola shape is, uh, is there, but uh, the amplitude is completely wrong. Yeah, and this is the effect uh, that stems from not resolving well the underlying coefficient A here, because as you can see, the mesh size that is associated with this approximation is about one half, whereas the fine scale oscillation lives on the scale one over thousand. And now you see the problem does not disappear under mesh refinement. Yeah, you see the blue curve here, the solid blue curve remains, uh, there remains a gap to, uh, with respect to the original red solution. Yeah, and in the error plot, you see that the error does not decrease, but uh, remains constant for quite a while. Yeah, and the gap between what in principle uh, with piecewise linears could be achieved in terms of approximation and what is actually achieved by the finite element method is uh, increasing under mesh refinement. And only once your mesh gets so small that you start resolving the actual coefficient, then you start to jump to the solution and uh, you are back in the asymptotic regime of convergence that is probably familiar to you when you are trying to approximate the pure Laplacian or something like that. Okay. okay. So this means that in the finite element method, there is a long kind of regime uh, where you don't resolve your coefficient. We call it the pre-asymptotic regime where you don't get any convergence. And if you would now try to approach even more uh, challenging problems like wave propagation problems, you could even increase uh, severe stability issues on top of that. Okay, and the aim uh, of this uh, lecture or the aim of homogenization would be to kind of uh, try to approximate this problem here, the complicated one by a simpler one that is easily solvable by the finite element method. Uh, what we want to do is uh, we will do something similar, but uh, we will take a more direct path that will also be valid for coefficients that don't have this nice periodic structure. Okay, I will try to explain you the approach on the simplest possible model problem, which will be the one we have just seen in 1D. And uh, at the very end of the lectures, maybe on Wednesday, I will have, uh, I will show you a few slides to convince you that the approach is very useful also in uh, more uh, applied problems. Okay, so. For, for my lecture today and tomorrow, this will be the model problem. I will consider this prototypical second order elliptic linear differential, partial differential operator minus divergence A gradient U. And uh, we wanted to equal some right hand side that is given to us. The, the, our domain will always be bounded Lipschitz. Uh, since later on I will do computations, I will usually uh, consider polygonal or polyhedral domains. Uh, this is really not the issue of this talk. You can think of the cube always. That would be an appropriate model. And uh, I will also not discuss uh, more complicated boundary conditions than just the homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay, uh, I will sometimes call the operator calligraphic A. And as you can see, I highlight here the coefficient A, which I uh, try to have as general as possible, uh, meaning for this lecture that I will consider here L infinity coefficients, possibly matrix valued. And, uh, but I won't leave the nice elliptic regime. So uh, I will consider A to be bounded from below and above in the usual way so that we don't have to worry about well-postness of the problem. 
but, but the kind of coefficients I'm thinking of are not uh, purely periodic, but uh, could be, for example, as shown here, a cut through a fiber reinforced composite material, or here you can see a cut through a porous medium that comes from petroleum engineering. And as you can see in these kind of problems, I, I don't have necessarily periodic structures that I could exploit. So I, I'm looking for an approach that is so general that it can deal with also with such coefficients. So no periodicity assumption and also no clear scale separation, okay? Uh, so there's, it's not that uh, there's only happening something on a micro scale and on a macro scale, but in principle, there are kind of features on all scales in between. Okay, here's a weak formulation of the problem, and I was actually hoping that the analysts uh, that are that were talking before me would introduce it, and they uh, they did it. Uh, many thanks to them. So I don't need to kind of go into the details of the variational formulation anymore. Uh, just again to be very clear. So my coefficient is assumed to be an L infinity matrix valued. For the sake of simplicity, I will consider the symmetric case that makes some of the arguments a bit more illustrative. It doesn't have to be symmetric in general. And uh, my space or my solution space will be called V most of the time. And V is just the space H1 uh, that includes the homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition. I use here the more general uh, notation of the Sobolev space W12 because later on the, the letter capital H will be used for the mesh size and in order to avoid confusion, I try to avoid the H10 notation, but this is nothing but H10, okay? And then we are looking for solutions, for weak solutions of our PDE, so solutions of this variational problem. Our bilinear form is called A, it's just a integral over the domain D, A gradient U gradient V, equals our right-hand side, uh, which I typically assume to be in L2. Yeah? And uh, I should maybe say at this point that this is some sort of regularity assumption, and this is the type of regularity assumption where I will be able to uh, extract some powers of approximation from. In some cases, uh, we can only consider the kind of minimal regularity F in the dual space of V, which would be H minus one. And sometimes we will actually need the L2. Okay, so again, please recall the notation. A is our bilinear form and the right-hand side functional, I will typically call uh, capital F. Now, just uh, one slide on periodic homogenization. This is kind of uh, the expertise of the other speakers, but just to show you the conceptual difference that we want to make today. So in periodic homogenization, you would consider a diffusion coefficient A epsilon that is embedded into a whole sequence of coefficients with finer and finer uh, or with smaller and smaller oscillation lengths or period length. And then one would look for appropriate limits as epsilon goes to zero. And uh, hopefully one finds uh, in the limit some operator that is independent of the small scales. And uh, in this particular setup that I'm that I'm using here in my model problem, actually one finds a partial differential operator of the same format as the ones uh, on the left-hand side here. And all the, all the limiting business goes, happens on the level of coefficients. So for a sequence of uh, coefficients with finer and finer oscillation, it turns out you end up uh, with a uh, more or less uh, homogeneous coefficient A0 uh, in the limit. Yeah? And then one way of kind of numerically uh, appro approximating the corresponding homogenized solution would be, uh, I'm sorry, that's a limiting business, uh, would be to then discretize the homogenized problem by your favorite method, finite elements, finite difference whatsoever. And uh, you typically, I, we consider mesh-based approaches. So this is just a representative mesh and capital H could be the corresponding mesh size. Yeah, yeah and uh, this way you could approximate uh, the homogenized solution. 
uh, one typical extra step that one has to do is that the homogenized coefficient that comes out of the limiting process also has to be approximated uh, in numerical method. Typically, this is some sort of uh, numerical quadrature that one has to apply here. So that would be the standard approach. If you have knowledge about uh, like a, a homogenized equation, so if there is, if, if your problem is periodic or close to being periodic and you can go to the limit and you have a representation of the limiting homogenized problem, then of course, in a straightforward way, you can construct numerical schemes. And this has been done uh, already in the early days of homogenization theory. Okay, here's a more kind of uh, general notation for this limiting process. So for my particular model problem, one, for example, could consider uh, the limit uh, in L2. So we could consider the operator here as a mapping from an L2 right-hand side to an L2 solution. And this way you could compare the sequence of coefficients, uh, sorry, operators with oscillatory coefficients and the limiting coefficient. And uh, this will converge. And uh, in the purely periodic case, one could even quantify the rate of convergence to be of order epsilon. And the best thing about this theory in the periodic case is that A0, although it's not known explicitly, what people have is a representation or an implicit description of the limiting coefficient through a so-called corrector or cell problem. And once you have this available, yeah, then this is a very efficient kind of uh, model reduction technique. Uh, that one should also exploit in practical computations. Now, as I tried to motivate before, I, I want to know actually, can I do something if I don't have a homogenization limit available? In particular, uh, um, maybe a more general statement would be that homogenization limits are actually available in very, very general scenarios. Uh, what is more problematic from a computational point of view is that the representation for or computable representations for A0, they are typically only available in periodic cases or say uh, small perturbations of the periodic case. And but as I've shown you before, in some cases, uh, the, the world is not always periodic but we still need to do some model reduction in order to make uh, predictions for certain physical processes. And that's why we are interested in, in the question, can we get an approximation of uh, my oscillatory diffusion problem also uh, in the absence of the periodicity assumption? And this is what, what we want to do in numerical homogenization. And, uh, as you see, I phrase my problem now without an epsilon because there is no clear epsilon that I would be able to uh, identify. And uh, the aim of numerical homogenization is to simply approximate uh, such a diffusion problem by some sort of discrete problem. And discretization here is indicated by adding the parameter h here. And you can think uh, as I said before, uh, you can think of H as being the mesh size of some coarse finite element type of mesh. And then LH, the one we are looking for, or the one that I will be constructing, uh, will typically not be related to a standard finite element discretization. But what we will do is we will allow a much more flexible discretization where basis functions uh, are non-polynomial, but uh, actually they are adapted to the partial differential operator that we want to approximate. So in some sense, what we are doing here is we trade the universality of finite elements. So you use, for example, piecewise linear to, to approximate all sorts of problems. Uh, but uh, so we we give this universality away. We adapt the method on the level of the basis function to the very problem that we want to approximate. And the possible gain that we can expect is that we get universal approximation bounds. Okay, let me ex uh, try to explain the goal here. So given a, 
target scale of approximation. So this would be my discretization parameter. For example, this is chosen uh, in correspondence to the computational power I have available or in correspondence to kind of the scales I'm interested in. But uh, H can be rather small, uh, rather coarse, uh, in particular much larger H is typically much larger than uh, the oscillation length, the characteristic oscillation lengths of prototypical coefficients as a two coefficient that you see here. And given such a target scale, we want to approximate the solution operator of our PDE by our discretized operator in such a way that whenever we measure errors in L2 for right-hand sides in L2, we want this to be of the order H at most. And uh, you will see uh, during this lecture theory is that this is actually possible. And the key step again is that we will have to leave uh, standard finite element spaces, but adapt finite element spaces to the actual problem. Yeah, the added value of such an approach is that uh, we get a characterization uh, of some sort of effective operator beyond periodicity and scale separation. So this is not required here. And uh, the questions for this lecture series would be, is this possible? And how does this LH or how can LH be constructed? How costly is it to compute it? How costly is it to evaluate it? And uh, because uh, most of you are interested in analysis, is there a connection to the homogenized operator in the periodic case. Okay, before I start with the actual con uh, construction, let me just uh, try to say with this one slide without going into the detail that this is really a huge field of uh, computational multi-scale methods. So numerical homogenization has been studied very extensively since the 1990s, uh, with uh, even earlier work starting in the 80s by Babushka and co-authors. And uh, you have probably heard about uh, the most prominent approaches in this area, like the multi-scale finite element method or the heterogeneous multi-scale methods. Um, but there are many, many more uh, in all for all for different applications with different uh, methodologies in the background. And uh, I will not be able to give you an overview about all these approaches. Uh, I will just, uh, let me just say the one word that, in my opinion, there are essentially two categories of methods. Uh, the first type of methods is related to actual homogenization theory. So if you have knowledge about the homogenized problem, say you have a corrector problem at hand, then you could use it to design a numerical method. Yeah? and you simply efficiently uh, compute the correctors from homogenization theory, and then you approximate the homogenized problem. And this, in this kind of category, I would kind of put, for example, the heterogeneous multi-scale method, and to some extent also the multi-scale finite element method. So mainly up to the early 2000s, people were mostly uh, studying such type of approaches. approaches. And then there's the other category of approaches that has a very different perspective. And that's the perspective I want to share with you. And that's more the perspective of numerical analysis and uh, approximation theory. And uh, our approach or the one that I want to present you is a localized orthogonal decomposition. It actually has its origin in uh, in the, in the finite element uh, stabilization of convection dominated flow problems on computational fluid dynamics, where it's known as the variational multi-scale method. And uh, I will explain it to you. I just want to say that uh, even today, this is really a very active field uh, with uh, many new approaches uh, popping up. Uh, very interesting ones, uh, for example, multi-level versions of this uh, that are now called gamblets and many, many more. Okay, but let me try to explain you this approach, which I believe to be representative for the large class of uh, 
say, uh, numerical homogenization problem, uh, uh, methods that do not rely on homogenization theory. Okay, and the approach is based uh, on the very simple idea of orthogonal subspace decomposition, uh, which I think has been popularized more in the community of fast solvers for partial differential equations, so multi-level solvers. So uh, time to start with some with the construction. Uh, as I said, the target scale uh, or the macro scale or the core scale, this will be uh, my rep be represented by capital H, which can be arbitrary course. And uh, I will consider a mesh based approach. So tau H here will be a regular course finite element mesh. You can think of a simplicial mesh or a quadrilateral mesh that's not important. I will stay with simply C's just because the theory is a bit more pleasant. And uh, on this mesh, I consider a standard finite element space of piecewise affine functions globally continuous. So in VH, I, con uh, I collect all the functions on the mesh that in each cell of the mesh are affine, globally continuous. And uh, what is hidden here is that the Dirichlet boundary condition is always built in this space. Here you can see an example of such a finite element function on the domain D that is a unit square. You see in each cell of the mesh, it's a linear function globally continuous and the boundary condition is always satisfied. And then my perspective on this homogenization problem is uh, the following. Uh, on the left hand side here, you could see you can see a prototypical solution of my heterogeneous diffusion problem. So I've chosen uh, a rough coefficient in the background and I solve the problem for a right-hand side f equal to one. And then as in our 1D example, we get something that on a macroscopic scale looks like a bubble, but then there are small scale oscillations on top of that. And if I would know the solution to my problem and I'm asked to just produce a uh, an approximation of the solution for a given target scale capital H. Uh, so a macroscopic description of my multi-scale solution, then what I would do from a finite element perspective is I would simply compute some sort of interpolation of this function here. Yeah, because uh, the interpolation on a coarse mesh is able to extract the macroscopic part of the rough solution uh, quite nicely, okay? Obviously, on such a coarse mesh, we are not able to capture with standard finite element functions any of the fine scale oscillations here. But say the game to play here is to get the macroscopic part, right? Then this would be a way to go. And now there's, of course, uh, there's some theoretical kind of limitations here. Whenever I say, interpolation i don't mean i don't mean point evaluation because point evaluation is not a well posed uh, process in more than one spatial dimension for h1 functions but uh, when i say uh, interpolation i usually use it together with the word quasi which means that i use uh, operators that are based on uh, local averaging okay that means in order to get the value here of my finite element approximation, I look at the function in the neighboring elements and I average, for example, uh, all the function values. And then I produce one approximation, then I produce another approximation here, and then I interpolate. Yeah, but this is a fairly standard in finite element theory, and these operators are called quasi interpolation operators. Now, for the construction of my method, I will just uh, now define the abstract operator IH uh, as an operator that maps my solution space H10 into the finite element subspace on the coarse mesh. I assume it to be surjective and I want, to, I want it to be quasi-local in the sense that I don't want to have a global operation, but I want that the value here, for example, depends only on the function in a certain neighborhood where the size of the neighborhood is typically of the order of H. 
And the third ingredient here or assumption is I want it to be projective. Yeah? Meaning that if I plug in a finite element function here, I want the same function to be reproduced. And there are a few more uh, technical or uh, assumption that I want to phrase here to characterize IH on an abstract level. Namely, uh, first of all, I want this operator to be bounded in H1, meaning that if, if I compute the gradient of the interpolation, this should be bounded by the gradient of the function in L2 up to some multiplicative constant that I typically hide from now on in the tilde notation. So here I hide multiplicative constants that are independent of the uh, problem parameters and also independent of the discretization parameters. Okay, and the second thing that is kind of encoded in this one line here is approximation properties. So, of course, you know, if you, you know from interpolation theory that if you compute the interpolation error, uh, and your function is actually smoother, then you can extract some power of H typically. Yeah? And the way uh, we can do this here is the following, our function is in H1. And, uh, but if you measure your interpolation error in a weaker norm, say in L2, then you are able to gain one power of H of approximation. And uh, this is achieved by many, many uh, quasi interpolation operators. Okay, and uh, there is another information hidden here, namely the locality. I want both the stability and the, the approximation properties to have a local nature. And this uh, comes by a local construction of this operator. I will give you an example in a second. But I, what I want is if I measure the error of interpolation locally in one element of the mesh, then this should scale like H up to uh, the gradient of the underlying function which I allow to compute not only in T, but say in T and its neighbors. So N here stands for T and its neighboring elements. As I said, there are many, many, many of these uh, operators. Uh, and my favorite is the following one that I have kind of prepared a small cartoon for you. Uh, say, given the function U here, and you can see in the, by the small black lines here, the coarse mesh. Uh, what I do is I do a two-step procedure. In the first step, simply in each of the elements, I compute the L2 best approximation in the space of affine functions. Okay, so on the left interval, I compute this green affine function and independently in the next uh, interval, I compute this green function and so on and so on. And uh, once I have computed uh, this best approximation uh, element by element, I, what I have to do is I have to produce a continuous function in order to be an element of the space. And I simply achieve this by averaging now in the nodes, the two possible values that I have here. Okay, that means I compute all the nodal averages in order to produce a continuous function. And in addition, I, of course, prescribe the zeros at the boundary. So that uh, after these two steps, I get a finite element approximation that I call IH of U. And this operator is well known uh, in the theory of domain decomposition methods mainly, and uh, has been analyzed in detail, for example, <clears throat> in this paper by Ern and Goodman. This is just one example. You can uh, construct many, many more. And then later on, at some point, uh, I will also need uh, a so-called uh, fine scale. Uh, this will be another kind of discretization scale that I call small h. Small h is supposed to be smaller than capital H. And uh, the underlying assumption is also that small h is so small that it resolves all the characters, characteristic features of our diffusion coefficient. And uh, with this scale, I also associate a mesh and the corresponding finite element space. But uh, please, the main message here is that the aim is not to compute uh, anything in this kind of very resolved uh, fine mesh because we have put ourselves in a situation where we believe that this is not computable. 
what we will do is uh, we will kind of uh, zoom into kind of smaller pieces of this mesh and this space in order to extract information from the micro scale that will help us to update the macro scale. Okay, and here's uh, the main part of the construction. Uh, this is our orthogonal decomposition. What I want to do is the following. I want to take my energy space, so the solution space H10, and I want to decompose it into what I consider to be coarse functions and fine functions. And there's a, not a unique way to do that. I will actually present you two ways. And the, the first way is kind of, of decomposing the space is given by our quasi interpolation operator. By construction, uh, the finite element space is, of course, the image of the quasi interpolation operator. And one way of decomposing H10 would be I decompose it into the image of IH, finite element functions, and the kernel of IH. So all the functions that in some sense are not seen by the interpolation operator. So W here, as I said, is the kernel of the interpolation operator. So these are functions that are mapped to zero by the interpolation operator. Okay, I use the notation W. W functions are more oscillatory than V functions or VH functions. And here's an example. So U is the prototypical solution of my diffusion problem. By IH, I would be able to extract the macro part uh, that I'm interested in. And uh, the W part here would be the remainder. Yeah. So that's, uh, I take U and I subtract the macro part. Uh, and you can see that this is a function that oscillates on scales, uh, capital H and smaller. So this here is what I call the micro part. Now, the problem with this decomposition is it uh, doesn't help us immediately because in some sense, there's too much energy yeah, in this part of the decomposition. And this is what messes up our Galerkin approximation. Now, what we will do in the next step is uh, the simple idea of the approach is to orthogonalize this decomposition. And by orthogonalization, we will get a new core space that uh, carries enough fine scale information to be very accurate. So let's see. Now, we are in the following situation. We have our space VH. This is our finite element space. And we have our space of fine scale functions W. And uh, they are not orthogonal with respect to the inner product associated with our problem that I call A here. Yeah? Because I had chosen the coefficient to be symmetric, A is actually an inner product. And this uh, allows me to use this notion of orthogonality. Okay, and uh, the idea is to orthogonalize the two. So I keep the W fixed and uh, I replace VH by the orthogonal complement of W with respect to our inner product A. Okay, so I simply do some sort of uh, Gram-Schmidt procedure. I have two vectors that are not orthogonal. I keep one fixed. I take the other one. I project it off in an orthogonal way to the given one that we call W here. And then I simply, you see, I simply subtract this projection and then I will get a vector or a whole space uh, that is orthogonal onto W. Yeah, and I do the same construction here on a, uh, on a subspace level. So the representation of our new core space would be, I take the finite element space and I, I, I take it and I subtract a correction. And this correction here is simply the A orthogonal projection onto the space W. Okay, so C here is what I will call in this lecture series, the fine scale corrector. So this is a projection, an orthogonal subspace projection. It maps H10 functions or finite element functions at this point finite element function onto fine scale functions. So it maps from the image of IH to the kernel of IH, uh, simply in an orthogonal way. 
Yeah? And orthogonality is characterized by the inner product A. So what I have achieved is now a decomposition of V into two subspaces. One, this one here is still uh, coarse in the sense that you see it's uh, related to standard finite element functions. So in particular, the dimension of the space is the same as the dimension of the finite element space. So essentially uh, as many degrees of freedom as interior vertices in my mesh. And uh, the remainder here are the W functions. Yeah? And the two are orthogonal with respect to our inner product. And here's a corresponding illustration. If I now compute the expansion of U into this decomposition, then you see that the fine scale part practically disappears. Whereas in the core scale part now uh, import, uh, Oh, sorry, uh, important information about the fine scales is carried. And now you can guess that if I do the orthogonal projection by a Galerkin method into this subspace, uh, this will be highly accurate because the error will be exactly what you see here in the fine scale remainder, you know, because of the orthogonality of the Galerkin projection. So if I do the Galerkin projection into this space, I will be extremely accurate. Now, this is the method and uh, on an ideal level still. Uh, so recall VH is a standard finite element space. C is this projection operator onto fine scales. And then there are many ways to write down the method. One way would be to uh, just seeking for a standard finite element function. Uh, and plugging into this corrector uh, operations everywhere in the variational formulation of the problem. Or I could have put here also the corrected space and uh, directly phrasing everything into this one minus C functions. But let's stay with the finite element function. So the ideal method simply seeks for a finite element function that satisfies this modified variational problem. Yeah, for test functions in the finite element space. So this here is uh, in this is a linear system of equation that is very similar to a finite element system. And because of orthogonality, I could uh, have the one minus c here or not. It doesn't matter because it's the same quantity. And uh, uh, let me close today's lecture with the observation why uh, why this is a good idea here. This UH here is exactly uh, the quasi-interpolation of U. And one sees this in this one line of proof here, namely if I, if I plug this in as a candidate for our solution and I test with any possible test function in my variational problem, then I can do the following trick. I, I add the true solution and I subtract it again. And then by rephrasing the terms, I can get such a structure. It's I can rewrite the left hand side here as u minus and then interpolation error one minus i h of u. And now you know that one minus i h because i h was assumed to be a projection one minus i h is a complementary projection that maps into the kernel of i h. So this here is a fine scale function in our notion and fine scale functions are orthogonal on objects in, that are uh, of the form one minus C of a finite element function. So, so this term drops and what remains is A of U tested with this test function. And because U is a solution, this links to the right-hand side. So in other words, we have just proved that this variational formulation here just reproduces IH. So it can be understood as a variational characterization of the quasi interpolation operator applied to a function u that is implicitly given through the PDE. And what you get immediately out of this is the following error estimate because uh is just ih of u. What you have found now with this variational problem is an approximation of u that is as accurate as the quasi interpolation. And because we assume quasi-interpolation to be accurate in L2, 
we can squeeze out the power of H here, uh, given the H1 norm of U, which always can be bounded by F even in H minus one, but F and L2 is fine for us. Okay, and this, uh, if we have F and L2, then one could even drop the correction on the right-hand side here without loss of accuracy. Okay, I think uh, with this, I'm almost at the end of my talk. Let me just uh, give a brief outlook uh, to the further lectures. So uh, this system here is uh, still called ideal. So what we have to do tomorrow is to really understand uh, whether or not it's possible to turn this into a method that fits into our computer and is actually efficient. You know, that's something that is completely unclear at this point because uh, so far there is this fine scale corrector involved and it's not clear how efficiently this can be approximated. And most of the energy in this lecture will go into the approximation and characterization of this fine scale corrector. And this is uh, just uh, an outlook how it will look like. If I would compute it exactly, uh, this variational formulation and put it into a matrix, a standard finite element stiffness matrix, uh, the sparsity pattern would look like this. So what you can see here is that uh, it's actually a dense object, uh, meaning that this C here, unfortunately, is not a local operator, but a global operator. On the other hand, I have color coded here the entries in uh, logarithmic scaling. So what you see as well is that there is a fast decay of the entries of the matrix, which indicates that although the C operator here is a global operator, it uh, decays very fast and can be approximated locally. Okay. And uh, how this works, uh, this will be the main theorem for tomorrow where we will continue, namely the exponential decay of the Green's function that is associated with this operator C. So I think for today, uh, let me stop at this point uh, and I'm very happy for your question, to answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter Sain. So do we have any questions from our participants? So you can uh, type in to our chat box. Um, so I can see a question that was uh, asked privately to me in the chat. I can maybe uh, okay. <laughs> call it here. So some participant is asking that uh, he or she sees a lot of multi-scale finite elements, but uh, he or she is unable to see homogenization in my approach. Uh, I, I try to, to explain that uh, our perspective to the problem is uh, uh, very different maybe, at least seemingly very different at this point. Uh, the spirit is more that of a multi-scale method, yes. Uh, I will reconnect this approach back to homogenization theory at the end of the lecture. And if you have a look at my lecture notes that I made available for you, and maybe this is the moment where I should uh, share with you the link to the course material that you can now uh, get in the chat. So in there, I, I prepared for you uh, some additional material uh, where you can also get uh, extra information. Now, where is it? Sorry. Let me show it to you. So for oh. those of you who are interested to dig a bit deeper into the problem, you are invited to uh, download both the slides and so the slides are available here and also some sort of lecture notes that are of course much more extensive than what I can uh, actually discuss in the three short lectures. Uh, but uh, for those of you who are interested and who actually want to prepare for the more theoretical lecture tomorrow, uh, you are kindly invited to have a look and uh, the material that I, or what I presented today was essentially a part of chapter two. Uh, tomorrow we will discuss uh, a part of uh, chapter three, and uh, then we will come uh, put these two pieces together to design the method, and then I will talk a little bit about implementation of that.
questions. Uh, I can see another question uh, in the chat here. What kind of operators can you treat? For example, nonlinear problems with interface question mark. Uh, yes, I mean, the list of problems we have been studying is uh, very long. And uh, maybe uh, at the third lecture, I will uh, make a bit more comments using numerical experiments to show you that the approach is uh, fairly, fairly general. Okay, so any other questions from our participants? Okay. Okay, so, well, you can still ask uh, Dr. Daniel uh, for the next uh, few days. But uh, we can, uh, I think we can rest for a moment and then we uh, come back by in 15, 15 minutes, minutes I, I think. Okay. Yeah, we have 15 minutes. All right. Indian time, 4.15 now, 4.30 as per schedule. 